Before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to quickly share something with you. If you grew up reading White Dwarf in the 90s, you're no doubt familiar with one of the editors at the time, Paul Sawyer, aka The Fat Bloke, who's had a, a fantastic career in the industry as a whole as well. He was the the co-founder of Warlord Games and he's done a lot on top of that too and there was some really sad news about Paul recently. It turns out he's been diagnosed with quite an advanced form of brain cancer and he, he anticipates that he potentially has less than 12 months left to live. So uh, this is obviously a devastating time for himself and his family and it's come to my attention that his daughter has a, a GoFundMe to basically um, make his last months on the planet as comfortable as possible and hopefully to, you know, enjoy a few experiences with his family as well. One of the, the little bits of good news in this was that he was going to become a granddad in that time as well. So that's obviously a lovely thing to hear in terrible circumstances. And, uh, you know, the whole community and hobby are, are really clubbing in here to to raise money to help that uh, limited time be as special as possible and for them to do as a family and, uh, you know, the things they want to do, experience the things that they want to experience together. So I'm going to put links in the show notes of the podcast to that GoFundMe page and if you're able to chuck a little bit of change Paul's way and his family's way, then I'm sure that'll be massively appreciated. Right, let's crack on with the episode. Brought to you by BedroomBattlefields.com, this is the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. Welcome to the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. On this episode, the Barry Gibb to my Clive Anderson. Mark, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. I'm flattered to be uh, the on the Gibb side of that um of that relationship there's a picture on the discord uh in the last couple of weeks and it was an old a really old manticore wasn't it and um <laughs> some somebody had mentioned that it looks uh it looked like barry gibb at combined with a toothbrush i just couldn't stop thinking about that i think it was john that mentioned that but i i couldn't stop looking at it after that so yeah and it's it's just like one of those iconic things now where you'll never look at a mantic or barry gibb or a toothbrush in the same way ever again yeah because as well like manticores were, were traditionally such credible models up until now as well weren't they so that's yeah, absolutely the creme de la creme of uh <laughs> of miniatures so uh yeah last time we spoke and in, in person if you like was was down at bring out your lead so that's um well, we're the eleventh now, so we're 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 over a month, aren't we? So the dust all settled on your trip down there. Yeah, it seems like a, a distant memory now, um, with autumn well on its way, and those uh, lazy days of summer behind us. But yeah, it was a fantastic experience, and definitely one for the calendar for next year. I, I think it was um, it didn't disappoint at all, and uh, you know, I think I'm sure you'd agree, and other people who were there, it was. It was really perfect for we we've talked for a while, haven't we, about what our community would would value and what a get together would look like. And and there was this sort of real sense that the sort of elephant the manticore in the room was the fact that um bring out your head was that was that and it sounded perfect. And and it really was. It really delivered on that level, I thought. Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. I wasn't disappointed in the slightest. I didn't, I didn't expect to be disappointed, um, which is unusual for me. But uh, I know really, really great. But I, it feels it feels like quite long ago now. So, um, what you've been what you've been working on since uh, since then? Um, yeah, a bit of everything really. I, I've cracking on with this wood elf army, this Warhammer wood elf army. Um, I say cracking on. I haven't I haven't done loads of painting on it, but I, I've. Been sticking models together and getting everything ready, undercoating stuff, basing things, all that kind of stuff. So I've pretty much got everything I want for this now. And it was one of these things where it started as a, um, well, I'll just just buy a few, and it kind of escalated and got out of hand pretty quickly. But I'm now at the point where I can't really think of a lot more that I want for it. And I'm, it's really cool actually because it is sort of, it's going back to that nostalgia thing. It's it's something that I never did as a kid that you look and go, oh yeah, do you know what? 12 year old me would look at this and say oh this is amazing but getting it painted is the is the next step really and i do i am beginning work on it but i want a bit of motivation actually um on that uh david in who's in our community is on behalf of the crown of command community doing their um call of the crown 
four, I think, um, paint challenge this year with a, a view to helping people come together and do a monthly pledge as to what they're going to paint to paint an old school fantasy army. So I'm going to use that, which starts on the 1st of October, as a bit of a motivator and a bit of a thing to provide a, a timeline for me to, to work on it with a view to getting it all done by the end of March, which I think is possible because uh, although there's a lot of points worth of models in the army, you know, there's a lot of expensive models in terms of points, you know, dragons and tree men and those kind of things. So I think, yeah, it's probably about 150 models, something like that. Um, mm. About 20 or so of which I've painted. So I'm sure it's doable. Um, um, but I'm just looking forward to getting that done. Um, we also managed to get a bit of gaming in and um, some things like that and chatting to other people. We've got our next session of the Royal Law coming up on Monday. So speaking to people about what things we're going to do there. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a good productive few weeks actually in terms of thinking about the hobby and um, and all the opportunities that brings, whether that's painting, modeling, buying things, getting together, talking to people, playing games. It's, yeah, it's been a bit of everything. So it's been nice. Are you getting like a, a pretty regular time to paint each week or is it more sporadic? It's fairly good. Um, usually I can paint for not a particularly long session, um, but probably half an hour on, I'd say, the majority of evenings. So, yeah, I'd probably get, so I'd probably feel four to five evenings out of seven, I'd get half an hour on it, which actually adds up pretty well so i think that that's that's quite good so yeah i've been i've been pleased to be able to get that time it's partly a bit of an effect of the fact that you know my kids are older so that, those kind of evenings that get really absorbed with all the stuff you've got to do when you've got little kids like getting them to bed and doing all that kind of stuff they they you know they do for themselves so my time is a bit more flexible but um at the same time it's it's just a, a good way of saying well i'm not going to just sit and just look at a phone or watch something on TV. You know, it's a chance of doing something that's a little bit uh, less screen-based and certainly more relaxing. And it's also the kind of thing that if you get it right, you can combine it in socially. So, you know, I'll chat to my wife while I'm doing it and she'll do something else. So that, that's always quite nice as well. Yeah, I'm sort of getting, uh, I would say, a, a sort of average week for me. I'll get half an hour on a, a Tuesday, half an hour on a Wednesday and half an hour on a Thursday. So... Mm. Like a, a a real average for me, I guess, would be about an hour and a half a week, which you could you could um chip away at stuff for that amount of time. I've got very little setup or takedown time, so that helps, you know, you're just straight into it yeah. basically. And I do like the I've talked about it in the past, the drawn from Hemingway's uh writing advice, you know, finish your um finish your work halfway through a sentence one day and then when you get back to it the next day you'll uh you're not faced with a blank page and i kind of like that approach with painting where i maybe have a little bit that's really easy that i could finish on and i, I prefer to to leave that as something i could start on the next day because and not that i struggle with motivation now to get started i'm in quite a good habit with it but um it's just a nice easy way to to get in rather than knowing that you're starting with something that's maybe a bit more tricky let the fingers warm up i suppose yeah, that's really good advice, actually. I've not really thought of it that way because I think that psychologically there's something where you feel like you want to finish things off for each session and put it to bed. But actually that does then result in um, you don't have that um, ability to transfer some of the, mem the momentum onto the next session. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to think about. I, I might try and incorporate that. I mean, we big miniatures painter, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Drinking drink that huge. And <laughs> the manticore's head on his wall. Yeah, Spanish Civil War, but with a manticore. That was his take on it, his alternate reality <laughs> take on it. Um, tell us about Spoonhammer. You had a, a game of Warhammer and Weather Spoons. That's tremendous. What a headline! <laughs> yeah, and didn't get glassed. So, um, in fact, got commended for it by the by the staff. Um, so yeah, I met up with Jason, and we we went and did that. Um, it was great. So we went for the morning session rather than a, you know, Friday night Hindu time. So that was probably the right thing to do. And um, it, it worked really well. Um, you know, their tables there are not particularly big. So we kind of got like a, I don't know, five or 600 point sort of 
small Warhammer army and play through a game. And then Jason also had some small scale stuff. He's got like 10 mil stuff. And that we were able to then play, you know, essentially a big game, but scaled down. And yeah, it was, it was a really good way of doing it. It's a good way of meeting halfway and just spending a few hours. But also, it, it just kind of opened up the conversation with a few people, you know, the staff there or, or and nearby people who just kind of, oh, what are you doing? Because I think there's a, a long tradition of, pub games isn't there and playing cards and whatever it might be board games and so on dominoes but this was kind of actually felt like it was continuing that and um yeah they, they were really keen to see it because i think you know people spending longer there and and buying more stuff is what they're all about but it was um it was just a really good way to do it and um yeah it just felt like a really kind of it also broke down that barrier that playing something like because we, you know, we were playing proper old school warhammer and got essentially two small games in whereas it would be easy to kind of conceive oh that's too much work that's going to take ages you're going to have to set up loads of terrain loads of things and it's you know it's a big undertaking and you need to set aside masses of time whereas it was a good way of illustrating that you can do it in a simpler more pop-up style so that was good yeah i i mean it's uh, it's it's just such a a fun concept and um i I mean weatherspoons it's a for for listeners sort of outside the UK, like it's, how would you describe it? Like a very big budget chain pub um, that attracts a certain clientele, including myself. You know, I'm not being a snob about it, but the price of beer in there just seems to go down rather than up. Like a pint's like one fifty if you're drinking certain cascales or that. So it's it's pretty incredible on that front. Yeah, it does defy economics, doesn't it? Yeah. Sticky tables too. How was that for pushing uh, units around? I just imagine you'd need like to to be chiseling them underneath to to get them off that. Table. Was actually, I think Jason got there early and he he chose the cleanest one. I think so. Yeah, we were all right. Um, which again doesn't say a lot. The cleanest one. It was. It was. A, we were in Warwick though, which is quite a quite a well to do place. So I, I think that that was probably the that was probably the way to do it is to um is to go to quite a flash place and then go to the the cheapest pub there that's probably the right way around yeah i mean to be fair to the company like you you do get um not to make this an episode about weather spoons itself but like you do get <laughs> some nice weather spoons pubs because their their policy seems to be to to buy uh, pretty attractive decent old buildings a lot of the time like um i'm a bit of a weather spoons connoisseur so like baker street in london that's a, a really nice building there's a few of them down there that are you know, nice venues. So, um, and you can, like, yeah, this was like an old, like, old one bank day. or something like that. It was pretty, yeah, it was quite nice. So, yeah, it was one of the, it was one of the better ones, definitely. I've been to some that, uh, you know, maybe lack a little in terms of the, um, of the ambiance. But, um, yeah, it's a very strange concept to try and describe it. In fact, I don't know what it's like because I'm being completely, um, sort of skewed in my mind as to what it's like but i kind of get the impression they might be a little bit more like the american bars that you see like uh moe's on the simpsons and cheers it kind of has that vibe to it somehow with people who go in there every single day and are there for 14 hours a day yeah and spend six pounds um yeah <laughs> are, you, are you going to be writing a battle report for the weatherspoons publication because again if you if you know you're listening and you've never been in a weatherspoons you get like the magazine that sits on the table and it's ba- the guy's like a you know whatever side of the political fence you lie and like he's a big brexit man so he's got this magazine and it's just pretty much him ranting about brexit uh, throughout the magazine but i like the thought that maybe you know one page of that could be a warhammer battle report uh, just yeah. to break that up a wee bit so as long as it's like a uh, albion versus the empire um yeah. report then he will tick his box yeah big tim he actually looks a bit like a fat manticore so just uh, continuing the manticore theme here <laughs> so i'm taking it you're not sponsored by them yet but you're angling for it yeah yeah print my pdf and weather spoons that's going to be whoever replies to me first so the, the other thing that's notable at um weather spoons that is sort of tangentially linked to this podcast is the fact that going to the toilet is not dissimilar to navigating your way through Jareth's castle um, yeah, in every single weather spoons for, for no particularly relevant reason. Going to the toilet is really, really difficult to do when sober. It is a proper so, yeah. dungeon crawl. Yeah. Yeah, it is. 
you know those, those sort of like I, I don't know what kind of wood but sort of mahogany coloured doors there's hundreds of them almost yeah. all of them are locked with no signage and there's one that you're looking for but it's not really um, identified that easily so aye, it's a lot of travelling corridors uh, bumping into people that may or may not live in a dungeon and just trying different <laughs> doors to see which one opens so it is, it is yeah pretty real life hero quest isn't it it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of three orcs in a room, um, and you've got to get in and get out. Now, you managed to play anything else recently then? You mentioned games, so I'm assuming there was more than one. Only a little bit of stuff at home, so just um, just a, a little bit of solo, uh, trying out a few things, um, just sort of experimenting with stuff, really. So, no, that was the, that was the main thing, actually. Um, we have got a game stay that, that we're running in October, so I'm really looking forward to that. Another one of the big Warhammer games. But, yeah, no, it's more been just trying stuff out. I did do a remote, I don't know if I spoke to you about this, I did a remote game of Warhammer with David, actually, and that worked really well. That was really good fun, and he documented that and put that on his um fifth hammer youtube channel um that was in about maybe june or july and that that was great as well and obviously a bit of gaming at bring out your lead so i feel like i've probably done a bit more than i have but yeah no in terms of kind of stuff at home it's just more been just sort of pushing a few models around just trying to get to grips with some of the rules around um enjoy playing space weirdos at boil and um i just trying that sword weirdos the fantasy equivalent of that the other day but i think that that's going to be a potentially a really good fit for um using for the the, the jeff solo adventure campaign um and uh chatting to ed and someone else in the discord who was saying that the the dungeon crawl mode of the solo um sword weirdos rules is particularly good and it looks great actually so i was at the weekend just and a quick try out with how that might work and you know without too much stuff just to get my head around it it does seem really fun yeah i had a wee look at that myself and i've i've, I've got the rules uh the sword and space weirdos rules so i was looking at that myself after you'd posted it so yeah i mm. looks looks a pretty cool wee way to to get that dungeon crawl experience doesn't it so um yeah, that, it had a kind of clever thing about generating, you know, when you've got this many doors, then that, then you don't place any more rooms. So just those kind of limiting factors that I hadn't really thought about how you'd randomly just generate something, but it not just go totally random and not work. Um, so that was cool. I also picked up one of those um, fighting fantasy books in, have you got any of these near you, where it's like a disused, not a disused, but decommissioned um, telephone box that's now been converted into a community library where you can normally get copies of daniel Steele books and things yeah i've seen them i've seen them about yeah in some of the, the wee villages yeah so you've been picking up some decent stuff out of one of those yeah so i went for a walk one evening and then was sort of wandering around in the dark in the countryside with a fighting fantasy book which was you know quite quite cool that i managed to find that and so i was trying that out the other day actually and having not played those games since i was little like properly it was actually really really difficult to, to complete because not only do you have to go through the maze in like the exact right order um and find all the things but just the chance of getting killed by like these absolutely you know pathetic monsters because you roll really low on your stats at the start of the game it, it's actually really difficult um and it's you can see why people certainly cheated with the um the trusted five finger method which i i'm proud to say i didn't employ but i didn't win so what book have you got then um it's called um the forest i think it's the forest of doom so the forest of doom or the forest of death one of the two but yeah it was really cool there's like some kind of weird like morally dubious bits in it which are interesting and you kind of wonder whether or not it would have flown like now in terms of children's you know because it was released by puffin books i think you know a children's publisher but it was there's things like you know you you find a man who looks like um i don't know he looks like looks like a bit of a wild guy and he's got his foot caught in a snare trap so you decide to help him and then he robs you and stuff like that so it's just kind of i don't know really you don't really get rewarded for doing the right thing a lot but it was kind of kind of the harsh grim dark reality of uh, living in a fantasy world is quite well described but yeah it certainly doesn't really have goodies and baddies and you're punished for helping that's a life lesson you'll never do that absolutely again. <laughs> yeah if <laughs> someone's got day. their foot in a snare trap don't trust them the next day they're out and about and like some old woman's broke her leg on the side of the road and you're like, I'm not falling for that. 
<laughs> <laughs> exactly. Life lessons from uh, fighting fantasy. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've had a, I've had a reasonable amount of games in the past couple of months. Uh, cool. Played a couple of games with Robert, my brother-in-law as well. Um, you know, he was in uh, Warhammer as a kid, and he's, he's painting a lot of stuff uh, these days. So, had the chance to, to try out my, my fledgling rule set with him, uh, and I'm oh, cool. to get another game of that again soon, and just keep uh, beating it into shape. I've had some great feedback folks on the discord too um a couple of couple of folk have been really generous with their time and give me some detailed feedback and uh hi it seems to be coming together i'm I'm quite happy with the the process and also just enjoying it as well so yeah i think that the idea of developing because you know developing your own rules like you mentioned in the last podcast you know those questions around you there's so many things out there why develop your own and and so forth or or at least string together things that you've seen from other places and collate it but i think that it makes you realize that there's so many different experiences um that you, that you can have when playing a game um someone the other day mentioned something about they enjoyed i can't remember what game it was in so you know, i'm probably sort of semi misquoting this but it was something to do with it to do something spectacular you had to roll a six on the six-sided dice and then a, and then another six and although that's only luck because you've kind of feel like it kind of felt like you'd done it and i think that, that mm-hmm. I, and some people were chatting about using cards and using dice and sort of like that kind of idea that you you know what cards are in the deck so if you roll a die, it kind of feels a little bit more like you chose to do that, even though it's luck. And it's kind of that, that sort of whole idea of what why something feels good or um, what you enjoy about something. It's really hard to to kind of clarify. And I think that's why if you're writing something for yourself, you can lean into all the things that you prefer for whatever reason and, and incorporate more of that stuff in it when other people might say, oh, well, sort of objectively, maybe it's not the best way to do it. But I can really see the advantage of being able to Pick and choose the elements that you find the most fun. I totally and and yeah, those um those wee moments you could create like a, one of the one of the things that I've been playing with and, and my rule sets are uh, you know the the six being a success and the one being a failure. I know well a that a lot of games employ that and b you know there are um, criticisms of it, valid criticisms as well. It it could be a bit gamey, mm-hmm. it could be a bit silly even, but um. One of the things I was I was sort of working on was like a six being a success and a one being a failure. But if the attacker gets the six and the defender rolls a one, that's you know you're dead no matter how many wounds or what your health's like or what your strength's like. Uh, and when I was playtesting just a wee in a wee solo sort of scenario, I actually did that. You know I'd shot at this guy right over the table and um, rolled for us both and rolled a six and a one so killed him and it's that wee moment of like wow that was pretty cool um and all that's yeah that, that, that really sort of idea nice. of the two extremities yeah yeah that's cool yeah. yeah i can see that working well like psychologically it feels like you know you know it's technically it was a like one in 36 chance or something i don't know mm-hmm. i don't really know how you work that out something like that but either way it, it isn't that infrequent but at the same time it's infrequent enough that it feels like it fits with that kind of oh I can't believe that happens kind of moment that's how you want to feel don't you like the you would you, you it becomes notable and you're like oh wow I couldn't believe that happened um mm. and I don't think you need as high an odds to, for to make something unlikely as as you think Andy yeah. Chambers was he talking to you about this or was he talking to someone else apologies if it, I'm not sure but he was saying about it's amazing how many times you actually don't roll the dice in a game you know, so that you don't get a particularly average set of results in one game because there's not that much that actually, you know, you don't roll it as frequently as you think. Um, yeah. So you can have a bad game, genuinely. Are you um, are you going to be getting Hobgoblin when it comes out? I think I've seen on, like, Amazon that it's uh, sort of end October. That'll be available on there, which seems the most oh, okay. straightforward way to, to buy it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd looked at it and I'm kind of interested by it, but I suppose there's an element of potentially just it not being, I don't know if it's something extra to look at and extra to kind of digest when I'm just getting my head around what I do know. So there's, that's probably the only reason I wouldn't. It's just because I'm already getting familiar with some rules and getting more interested in 
certainly like previous editions of Warhammer. And yeah, I think that would probably be my my nervousness about doing it. It does look good, and it certainly looks like it meets its design goal, but I suppose there's an element of also considering whether that design goal is my game goal or not. Um, so I'm kind of potentially leaning a bit more into the slightly more detailed, slower games at the moment for whatever reason. But it does look really smart, and um, and I think it, it works. From what I can imagine, it would work really well because I know – like Mike Hutchinson is certainly one of those people who will be able to really refine a game system down and make it work smoothly and and iron out all the creases. But maybe some of those creases and some of those kind of inaccuracies and problems that uh, uh, you know someone might iron out of a system that are in you know old editions of Warhammer and stuff. Uh, I actually quite like some of those things. So there's an element of um, not wanting to depart too far from something that's a bit broken and a bit mad. Yeah, I definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, in terms of like having a sort of rank and flank game rule set. Like, I'm I've not really dabbled in the old editions of Warhammer, um, you know, as much as I've got a fondness for them, and I, I, I it does appeal to me the the sort of randomness and the fun elements in there. So back when I was uh, dabbling with Kings of War, uh, I did notice that the rules were very, very solid, but I thought they kind of lacked a wee bit flavour as well. So yeah. I dare say, you know, that's to an extent up to the players to bring that uh, with their armies and with their narratives and scenarios. But um, Mayhem was was one that I definitely enjoyed. Brent Spivy's Mayhem. And yes. uh, I having these two 15 mil armies, I'll, I'll definitely be interested to give them a shot with Hobgoblin as well. So I, that'll be kind of November, I'd imagine. We'll be getting a game of that on the table. I look forward to it. Yeah, that'd be great. How, I mean, how how close are you to finishing the painting? It looks pretty near, actually, from what I've seen. Yeah, I mean the 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 two armies. So like the human sort of empire and dwarf allies. Um, I'm pretty much finished that. I I, I think I could cool. put eight or nine units on the table, including the command uh, unit, which mm. is just four guys, but it's still a unit in its own. Uh, so it's like um. Foot Knights, that's one unit. Dwarf Spearman, I've got two units of mounted cavalry, two units of archers, uh, and a cannon, I think it is, and crossbowmen too. So, aye, it's like Excellent. you could put that down on the table now, and it's a big army. Um, yeah, that's plenty as well. Because, I mean, even if you forget about the number of models, the actual number of units, you, you, know, you couldn't, you can only keep an eye on so many can't you in terms of yeah. actual your brain working out what you're going to do and that's what slows the game down is having like you know if you had 25 units each or something it would just be inconceivable that you'd actually get through more than a few turns so yeah that sounds great yeah i've got a i mean that there's there is another unit that i've got um completely unpainted they're like human spearmen but i'm not going to be in a hurry to I will, I will get to them, but they're low down on the queue because that army, there's enough there, if you like. Um, and, uh, and crack on with playing with it and learning the games and then thinking, oh, those human spearmen will be good for this, that, or the other, or fulfilling a different role or something. Yeah, because they're, they're presumably, with, within whatever rule set you use, they'd have different abilities to the dwarf spearmen. Yeah, definitely. I, I for sure. Um, cool. And the, the the sort of baddies, like go, going on the sort of battle masters baddies type army, like we've got orcs and chaos warriors and stuff. Um, so the next up on the table for those will be, I've got two units of wolf riders to do and and two or three units of archers as well. But that's uh, that that army is is pretty big now as well. Um, what I am going to do. To, to sort of give me other options for this army. I, I got some 15 mil plague bearers on Etsy. I've not actually received them yet, but uh, these things sometimes take time if they're 3D prints. Um, and my thing behind that was I've already got Chaos Warrior allies for the, the Orc and Goblins. And then because I've now got the Great Unclean one, I can use him at a uh, 15 mil scale as well. I was, I was really surprised that... Um, how how short he is. Uh, again, you know, it's a miniature that was made a long time ago and he's he's very heavy in that, but he's not he's not that much taller than like an average 28 mil sort of 32 mil guy. 
So oh, really? Much, yeah, you kind of in your head, you imagine it's like the size of, like you know, I don't know, like six inches tall, but it's, it's yeah, and I, I, even like the Marauder Giants, not massive. You know what I mean? Yeah, that that is. So he'll look really good at all scales, won't he? Really? Yeah, exactly. I, I think he'd look especially good at fifteen mil. So I, I, I yeah. just thought, you know, get him some plate bearer pals and he could uh, throw his throw his weight quite literally behind that army. Um, but I, I mean, you, you, I, I wasn't expecting him to be this size. But when you look at the front of the um, the old Realm of Chaos books, and one of them's got the Great Unclean one, and he's like the size of a, a tower, basically. There's like people climbing up him and that. So uh, that's obviously a, a very exaggerated image of him. But um, aye, he'll, he'll still be great at 28, but I think he, he might um, stand out even more at, at 15. So. I am uh, I'm chipping away at those armies. Um, that's that's just over a year I've been working away on those two now. So I'm I'm uh, I'm really happy with, with how that's went. Uh, you know, to see fully painted armies that you've that you've sort of worked on over quite a long time is really satisfying, as I'm sure everyone will agree. Yeah, that's it's something about it that does. I mean, although skirmish games are great, and I really do have a fondness for them. The spectacle of a of an army ranked up is different, isn't it? And I think that that is a different experience than painting it. Although they can get a point where it can become a bit of a slog, and you might find that you sort of got a bit of muscle memory and you're just churning through things. But to see it all down and to sort of lay it all out, it is it's a different experience. And I think that you know you could do that with almost no terrain on a table, just a big green mat, and it look amazing. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think that I think that there is something really satisfying about that. And I, I painted last year those big um, sort of 19th century imaginations armies, and I've not really got around to playing it because my friend who I was going to be doing some stuff with on it, he's kind of not really been available because of you know various things in his life that have changed, and he's not really much of a gamer in a sense. So I, the arrangement was more that he was interested by the idea of it, and uh, I painted all the stuff up. I wanted to anyway, and he was going to kind of come over and we'd do games of it, but it hasn't really come to pass. But I need to get back to looking at that because the, yeah, the most satisfying thing that I have, the moment that was the most satisfying of that whole project, you know, I probably spent a year on that, was just taking a single photo right at the very end and just going, wow, it looks brilliant. But I really want to actually get some games in with it. Otherwise, it's a bit of a shame if it just sits in plastic boxes. You know, until I'm dead and then gets thrown in a skip or something. So, uh, yeah, make, make some use of it while I'm still on the planet. Yeah, get back to Weatherspoons, push some tables together, create a six by four in there and get to work. I, I think they bolt the tables to the ground. So that's the only disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> um, time of recording, we're, we're in the lead up to the, the Royal Orc on Monday the 16th. So, anything you could talk about on that front? Yeah, I mean, this is our um, fourth one. Uh, so we did one at Christmas last year, and then one in the spring, one in the summer. So here's yeah, our autumn one. So it's the fourth instance of it, which is great. Lots of people are really enthusiastic about it. Um, we've got, um, you know, the normal getting together, chatting about things, uh, you know, just kind of having a general co- catch up, which is, a you know, in some ways, actually, the main event. That's always fantastic. Um, and then we've also got a dungeon crawl game. So I wrote this really simple set of rules, just as a bit of a, a it might work type of thing that I was going to run last time. We didn't get time called Zero Quest. So it's a, I was trying to think, how could you make a dungeon crawl work? Where it do, I don't know how many players there's going to be. There's just going to be everyone who's in the call. And they can all just roll a dice and just see what happens and you know, just kind of do something as a collective. So it, it's very rules light and very silly. But um, I approached Ed, who um, did an absolute sterling job of um, games mastering our big space weirdos, weird Amunda game that he he ran uh, at Boil uh, that Callum and I played in, and it was brilliant. And so I said to him, you know, would you be interested in running that? And he was really keen. So he's going to run that for us, which is great, on Monday, uh, using those rules or adapting those rules. You know, he, he knows a lot more about this stuff than I do, so I'll leave it in his capable hands. Uh, but I'm looking forward to doing that. And we're also obviously going to have um, an opportunity just to sort of get together and talk as a group. And one of the things that you spoke about that you really want to talk about to the community and with the community about was the um, 
Jeff solo adventure uh, idea. You know, several of us have got models. Many of them have been painted up. Other people have, you know, started thinking about what they want to paint with theirs. And so the idea of getting people together on that call, say, well, what are you thinking about doing and setting out some kind of structure about it, having a discussion as a group about what what we think would be great. Um, And, you know, as loose or as formal as that might be, uh, that's going to be a a thing that we can use the the session on Monday to talk about as well. So I'm really looking forward to that because I think it's a really wicked idea. Yeah, for sure. I thanks to you and David for for doing these. They're really good fun. Uh, I don't think I could make the last one, but I made the couple before then, and it's it's really good mm. stuff. It's really enjoyable. So, uh, I Monday the sixteenth. That's um, is it eight o'clock UK time? Is that right? Uh, seven it? o'clock UK time. Seven o'clock. Yeah, seven UK o'clock time. till till nine when I have to go to bed because I'm old. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, bedroombattlefields.com slash discord if you want to turn up for that and you're not in the discord already yeah absolutely it's not it's not a closed group for people who have been before you know all you've got to do is jump in and there's a voice chat there and you just join that at seven o'clock next monday so it really is like for absolutely everybody whether you've been in a member for a long time or you're brand new it's everyone is more than welcome and there's nothing you've got to do in preparation other than maybe bring a six-sided dice yeah and be really into the Bee Gees as well. I'm I'm quite quite strict on that. So yeah, no. Well, I mean that's that's sort of a given, really, isn't it? I think. <laughs> um, I wanted to give a wee shout out too. Like if you if you're hot into the Discord, you'll find a events channel, and I'd seen a uh, Carla uh, Chicago Skirmish War Games is doing a get together on that side of the pond. It's going to be Saturday, November second. And you'll find all the details in the Discord. So um, I, if you're in that sort of Chicago area, that might be something that um, I'm sure will be worth going along to if you could manage to. It sounds really good. So uh, I find that in the Discord as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's great to see so many people doing things, isn't it? You know, like in their own communities and it becoming a bit organic, really. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I mean, as much as... Uh, the whole online thing is brilliant in so many ways. Like to be able to get together as well in person, you, you can't beat that. So just having a look, like they're having pizza for lunch at twelve. So maybe work a flight over for me. Get fed. Yeah, yeah. They're, I think they're having the Chicago deep deep dish pizzas as well, which presumably aren't particularly like the ones you used to get at school that you used to have to douse in gravy so that it became palatable do you remember those ones it was like a about sort of four inches of of like you know like hardcore bread and then a, a little little bit of cheese on the top and that was about it i used to buy chicago town microwave pizzas for my work oh, i remember those and, yeah uh, like a minute in the microwave they were limp yeah, and, and bendy. They- they were like, to be fair, they had quite a deep, well, dish for lack of a better term, but I used to find, you know, you'd microwave them and like the, the cheese on the outside was pretty much hotter than lava. And it, as you <laughs> yeah. ate way in, like you destroyed all the nerves in your mouth, obviously, but by the time you got to the middle, it was still actually a bit frosty. So you were sort of jumping through the the uh, the frozen piece so I Chicago town pizzas you couldn't beat them I, I dare say Carol's putting on a, a better quality of pizza than that so yeah I think they've got the best ones there I think that these these were a, a pale imitation like you say yeah like a cross between a sort of savoury lolly and napalm uh, just a couple of other things then I had uh, mm. I made a wet palette uh, last night I had another painting tutorial with Josh yesterday Excellent. so. I figured it was time to grow up and get the finger out and make myself a wet palette. So I, I've got a wee piece box and a couple of paper towels wet and a bit of baking paper. And uh, I, I started tentatively using that last night. So um, I, I did expect it would it would feel much better than the dry palette. And it does, of course, because uh, the paint is still actually moist by the time it reaches the miniature. So who knew? <laughs> yeah they are good aren't they i've got one actually i got one for christmas last year and i i'd previously been a little bit dismissive of it because i'd made one like you say like you've done but it I then went a bit mildewy and a bit manky and it started like growing you know, crests and covid and things in it so i <laughs> i'd moved on from that and uh thought oh well maybe it's not great but yeah the one that i bought um it is it's better 
by a lot but also i think that it's just really useful for if you need to um like i was thinking the main advantage would be to to kind of keep your paint keep your paint sort of so that you've got it all set out and all the colors are in there and you've you've got what you need and things mixed and blended and stuff but i've also found it a lot quicker because you've already got things ready to go and it just gets straight into it like it's that coming back to that hemingway thing you were saying earlier it almost feels like well that's halfway done i'm ready to go with that and i think that it's just proven to be a, a simpler way as well of of mixing things together without without kind of I don't know, ruining stuff. I've I've done it before where the paint's gone on too globby and it's gone on a bit thick. And I think, oh, well, what do I do about that and get rid of it and wipe it off? So, yeah, I've been making a lot fewer mistakes since I've had the wet palette. It really has changed things for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm just, I'm trying to not wean myself off contrast paints entirely because I, you know, have a lot of time for them and I get through a lot of stuff uh, to a, a level of my own satisfaction with them. But I mm. feel like I'm sometimes, uh, not quite doing the best possible work because there are just certain areas on some miniatures where I just don't think contrast paints work for one reason or another. Um, even certain colours, I, I really struggle to make certain colours look good with the contrast paints. Again, it, it's probably not the paints issue, it's probably mine, but I just feel using, going back to the more traditional paints will open up a lot more doors for me. So I am a... Uh, I'm just hoping to start getting a, a bit more use out of those old hex pots again and uh, oh, that's making great. things look a bit brighter. Yeah, I think that, that it, it probably does depend on the style you're going for, doesn't it? Because, um, yeah, I, I think I've not really used any contrast paints at all. And I think that the, my painting style is a little bit like old-fashioned looking, you know, quite bright and bold, but not particularly subtle. Um, and I think that I've kind of, I've got a bit stuck with things not being subtle enough. And that's when I had the painting lessons from Josh. He really helped me understand how to do that. Um, and I think that sort of, you know, the inverse of that is that a more modern style using the contrast paints and the, you know, perhaps the zenithal under, um, undercoating and stuff means that you get a, a more subtle gradiated approach, but then maybe sometimes it can be a bit desaturated and, and not kind of pop. So my stuff's, very saturated and bright but sometimes a little bit cartoonish and then someone else's might be a little bit always a little not dull but you know it's a bit more muted and i think that using the two things and two techniques in together is probably the way that you can get the absolute best results so i really found josh's advice really helpful for that just uh making those sort of marginal gains just to refine something from good to you know better without that really having to add a lot more steps or anything. It's more about the way you think of it and approach it and the confidence as well. So I'm glad that you're enjoying it and yeah, I look forward to seeing what you do with those old hex pots because they're brilliant that you've still got those. I'm, I'm very jealous. Yeah, I mean, with uh, getting back into the hobby, I think 2018 and, uh, you know, I've painted a lot since then. It's, it's funny to think of how long that actually is now. Um given yeah. that I always consider myself as someone who's just returned, but that's not really the case now. And, uh, you know, obviously having painted for that amount of time again, I, I am pretty satisfied with my brush control these days. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm passable, I'm competent at holding a brush and getting the paint where I want it to go, but I just don't feel at this stage that I'm good at necessarily using the paint or applying it or you know, various things. And that's that's all mm. part of doing these painting tutorials and trying to expand my horizons, I guess. So ah, fantastic. Well the stuff that you shared recently that you've done, I think looks really brilliant. And 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 even though, you know, you're saying some of it might be using the contrast to get through things, they I mean they look great and the colour choices are, are fantastic and really hold things together. But like the 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 Jeff model that you shared, I really think he looks really smart. And you know it, it, not only is it really neatly and well painted, but also really great color choices, and that goes a long way as well. Yeah, I do. I do get. I do get paranoid with colors because I'm so hopelessly color blind that I do. I do often wonder when I'm looking at something, there might be some horrendous mistake that I simply can't see. But uh, nobody's nobody's been uh, helpful enough to point it out yet. Everyone, everyone's just agreeing. It's a sort of like miniature painting version of the Emperor's New Clothes. So, <laughs> so you think that you're painting and it looks like sort of a beautiful Van Gogh, but it actually looks more like Funhouse. 
yeah exactly yeah yeah i um yeah, it's just it's some colours for me. I just cannot pick them out. Um, but again, that's another reason why I want to go brighter and more saturated and more contrast. Uh, whereas before, you know, maybe the last couple of years, I've I've went for more of an earthy, like a lot of browns and stuff like that, a lot of leathery colours, and um, which I I do I do like. But when you start to go at scale, when you when you look at a tabletop that a lot of uh, characters are on there with these more muted colours. Everything I think blends in a bit too much, and I would I would like to see more colour. So uh, that's yeah, my, I think that's maybe uh, maybe the size and the scale of of not only the miniatures but also the game that you're you're trying to create. You know, if you're going for a sort of old school rank and flank game, then maybe that brighter colour is the thing that will that will work well. You know, you've got those blues and yellows in your in your goodies army, and they work really well, don't they? Because they they just give that very clear definition that the, which side they're on what they are all that kind of stuff it sort of helps you read the game um whereas in a skirmish game maybe you, you're sort of more physically closer to it as you're playing it and thinking differently anyway so i think that that, that probably comes into it a bit but i think the stuff that you've been doing looks great i love the um he's a big ogre or a troll and he's got a massive stone handled no, stone club um that's yeah. really cool yeah i got him down at a at Foundry, so I. Really oh, of course you did, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful miniature, yeah. Not beautiful in the the handsome sense, but um, the the sculpt itself and the character. So, uh, I but like right. with, with with two big armies at scale. Like I do, I do like that. Um, almost like two football teams running out, and they've very obviously got contrast and strips. Like, uh, I like my. Yeah, they've got to wear their like, so kit like so it doesn't clash. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, I do think that having those contrasting sort of approaches to the to an army as well, and, and tying something together as an army, even though it's kind of mad to think that a fantasy army would be so organised as to make sure they've all got the same, you know, the same colour trousers on and stuff. But it actually looks right, doesn't it? And it's very Warhammer. Yeah, aye, it's really satisfying, definitely. Um, I guess just one one more thing to mention on this episode would just be a reminder. Uh, for the question of the month, this is September 2024. So you sent yours in, Mark, didn't you? It was around uh, which um, which person, dead or alive, would you love to play a miniatures game with and why? And I, w- I won't ask you to reveal your answer at this moment in time because we'll obviously play that on the episode itself. But did that uh, did that take a bit of thought or was it very obvious for you? It was a good question, actually. I really liked it. I think just one top tip for people considering that is how pleasant it would be to play a game with somebody who was dead. I think that, that that's something to bear in mind. But um, yeah, no, it was it's it's a really cool question. And actually, the more I was thinking about it, it um, you know, without saying what I've chosen, it was it, it was more a case of thinking, do you know what? Like, you know, you don't want to play against the greatest tactician necessarily, or the or the or or your hero sometimes maybe you actually want to recapture a moment and and so for me at that time i was sort of i was thinking back to so the memories i had of being younger and getting into the hobby and and that was that was my point of reference that i jumped off on on there yeah i'll direct the listener to bedroombattlefields.com slash voicemail to to record theirs and i need that before the end of september as well so thanks very much if you'll have the opportunity to send something in there um, anything else, Mark, before we get this episode wrapped up? I think that's it, really. But um, I did want to call out the fact that there's been some really cool stuff shared in the Discord recently and um, loads of people getting involved, new members, people who have been in there for, for a long time sharing things. And the one thing that is just completely impressive is how people, whenever they're what they're doing, it, it's almost Every single thing that someone says, oh, I've been working on this or I've played that or whatever, that, you know, someone else will come in and, you know, get lots of likes and so on. But people will almost universally say, this is great. Thank you for sharing. This is really interesting. And the, the amount of inspiration you can get, even if it's something you're not going to go off and directly do, I, I just think it's it's been really brilliant and it's becoming a really great community and just so supportive but also just so inspiring as well it's just yeah so if anyone's a member of the discord but not really got any nervousness about sharing you know have a look on there and you know you'll notice that everyone's super positive um but just you know if you're doing anything please share it because i just love to see what people are getting up to 
Yeah, I love how you look through it because um, as, I, as I'm constantly mentioning, like I don't have like a, an Instagram or that, you know, that's where a lot of people, I guess, will see miniatures and see paint jobs and that. But this is the place for me to to kind of keep touch with, with what folks are up to. So I just um, looking through the, the miniatures page, uh, like Ted, he's been doing brilliant work with those sort of conquistadors. Um, yeah, they're great. The Italians who are... That they've got like the sort of lizard men weapons and that. That's just a great idea, really thematic, isn't it? Yeah, it's just so cool. And and just seeing stuff that you literally, you know, that his his models will be the only models on the planet that look exactly like that. And, you know, it's the fact that when people share what they're doing, and Rob posted something this morning about a Skull Island Mordheim campaign that looks like unbelievable, you know, and you set up a little website for it. You're like, wow, this is so cool. There's loads of good stuff. Yeah, I see there as well. Ed painted up his uh, rhino that he got from Doctor Spork. They uh, they did that trade right outside the Emperor's own house down in Nottingham. So that's painted up Excellent. already. Great work getting that and done. And the paint has not like flaked away and revealed a death threat or something. <laughs> a cease and desist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah, great. Look- Looks like you've posted pictures of some sort of weird bacteria, but now that I'm looking closer, at it, it's like, uh, is it trees or something? Uh, I don't know. I'm worried that I've just been sharing, like, is it, a, is it a pocket post? Is it something that I shouldn't have shared? That's what I'm concerned about now. Just bacteria a bacteria tree. Testicles. Um, 50 tessel, tessel heads? Teasel heads? Oh, teasel, teasel, heads. teasel heads, yeah, yeah. They're, they were growing at the end of my garden, yeah, teasel plants. They're um, really spiky, and uh, I'll cut them off. And um, if anyone wants them, they're more than welcome to them. So I'm just putting all my old shit that I need to get rid of on the Discord as well. I've got an old greenhouse if anyone wants that as well. So, so um, I just one more shout-out for that, then the Discord, bedroombattlefields.com slash Discord and bedroombattlefields.com slash voicemail for the... Uh, question of the month as well thank you very much for your time today mark it's been a nice wee catch up yeah it's been great thank you i've uh, enjoyed having a, a an hour away from my work screen to look at it to, to, to chat about this and um it's always very pleasant indeed and uh it's just like great to catch up and great to talk about you know things that we've got that we're working on and yeah I urge other people as well in the community if if they want to reach out to you. I know you're always keen to have community members on. So if people have got interesting things to say, then you know don't just hear me banging on. Um, get other people on, please, because that's always great. <laughs>